welcome to our new video series which we're running throughout the month of January. We are calling it Digitization of the Landlord Lifecycle and we are hosting it in association with our friends and partners at Landlord. And what we've done for this campaign is to think about the different points of the landlord lifecycle that can be enhanced by the use of digital tools. And we've broken it down into four different areas uh, of, of the life cycle. Number one is pre-acquisition, when you're thinking about getting involved in property and you're setting yourself up to do so. Number two is acquisition, the actual legal process of buying a property. The third stage is ownership, management and growth. That's the longest period um, of, the, of the cycle where you could be in a relationship with investment properties for 20, 25 years. And the final part of the life cycle is when you exit your investments. And every one of those stages can be uh, optimized and made more efficient by the use of digital tools. So today uh, we're still in the pre-acquisition phase and I've got a special guest joining me. It's Henry Davis, who is a consultant uh, trainer for the NRLA and also a landlord since 1990, even before me, uh, Henry. So um, first of all, I'd just like to welcome you to the call and also to ask what you think about this idea of the digitization of the landlord life cycle. We're hearing about digitization of viewings, making tax digital, digitization of the land registry. It's very much a direction of travel in the industry. But when you started out, these, these tools didn't exist, did they? So what do you think, Henry? Hi, Vanessa, and thank you for having me on this webinar. Well, I think making yourself digital, doing everything on a digital basis rather than having endless bundles of paperwork and files, it's obviously the way the market is going. And um, me personally, I've tried to focus over the last few years on becoming a bit more organized. And I found the more organized I am, the more focused my business is. So for me, digitization, becoming digital is is almost like the number one thing on my priority list. Well, that's wonderful to hear, um, Henry, as we go, you know, we're into a new year now, and this is something that landlords may have had on their radar. And it's good to hear that somebody who's been in the game for as long as you has actually prioritised this. And maybe, you know, these calls that we're having with our guests and with landlord will help people and encourage them to adopt these digital tools. And for today's um, discussion, as I mentioned, we're in the pre-acquisition phase, and we are talking about tenant demand um, and finding tenants. Now, some people might say, well, actually, shouldn't that be in the next phase when you've actually got ownership of the property? But here at Property Tribes, we've always subscribed to find the demand before you create the supply. Is that how you've always operated? Well, I, I always start with who is going to be living in that property. Now, that only applies if I'm obviously uh, keeping the property because I'm less fussy if I'm selling it. But my first instinct, the first thing I think about if I'm buying a property uh, as a buy to let would be who is going to be living in that property and what's the local rent dynamics in that area. So if I was from Mars, let's say, and I've just arrived into an area and I knew absolutely nothing about the area, the first thing I would advise investors to do is to physically walk into three or four estate agents. But not only that, you need to focus on specialists. So for example, I do a lot of HMOs, Vanessa, which are a bit more hands-on, a bit more management. So for that reason, I would want to know the exact type of tenant demand. And the only way to find that particular answer is by actually speaking to a specialist. In other words, an agent who specializes in HMOs. Yes, I'm so glad that you mentioned talking to um, lettings agents because they are, you know, a mine of useful information. They, they really, really know their patch and they can help you understand the tenant demand in the area. And if we take that a stage further, they can also give you an indication of the type of property you should be buying. Because, of course, we've got, you know, houses, flats, uh, HMOs, different types of, of tenures. Um, and I, I, I'll use an example from my own landlord life. Um, when I was uh, thinking of investing in Basingstoke, I could see that there were thousands of flats 
but hardly any family homes. So I rang a number of local agents and they all said, don't buy a flat, there's too many of them, we've, but we've got a waiting list of uh, tenants who want three and four bedroom family homes. So that conversation and that research in the pre-acquisition phase actually helped me determine the type of property I should buy as well. So it seems, Henry, you're very much along the lines of you know having these conversations first, digging deep in the area, really getting to know your patch. Yes, you see, for me, there's two choices in property. You either go for cash flow or you don't, okay? So it's option one and option two. So if you want to go for cash flow, it's got to be a HMO because that's the only product that will allow you to have enough cash to pay off a repayment mortgage. But the downside of that is HMOs are more hassle. But in my case, most of my HMOs tend to be on suites and I'm very picky on the exact area and right down to the exact street. So even taking that into account, they are still more hassle, but if you get the right room size, as in a minimum of 10 square meters, you have an ensuite, the property is modernized, it's well kept, you should have a low tenant turnover. And low tenant turnover to me is where they stay for at least 18 months on average. And that would be the case with most of my HMOs. And then the second option is a single let family home, which arguably is actually a very good investment if you can find the right product in the right area. So here's the way property works. If you buy a single let property in a really good area, the figures are never going to add up. It's just going to be a really poor yield. But if you can find an area where it's not the worst area, it's not the best area, the tenants are good working, normal people working in normal jobs, then you could actually end up with say 8% yield on a single let, whereas you might only be getting 10% yield on a HMO, but the HMO is a hell of a lot more work. And one of the fundamental mistakes investors make is that they don't, don't know the, how to work out the actual real end HMO and single let end uh, yield after all expenses, because there's no point having a HMO doing all the extra work if you're only getting maybe one or two points up on your yield. In other words, HMO could be 10% and single let is 8%. Well, there's no point in having a HMO in my opinion. Well, it's very interesting that you, you say that, Henry, and I totally concur because we've got the landlord deal analyzer, which does mm -hmm. actually give you all of those metrics. And that's a prime example of using a digital tool to mitigate your risk. And I just picked up on something. You said you're either buying for cash flow or you're not. Yeah. And most people say you're either buying for cash flow or capital growth. Okay. Why, why did you couch it like that? Why did because you say that? Because capital growth is not an option, Vanessa because prices could fall for the next 10 years for all we know. And we all assume and hope prices will increase. And personally, I probably think they will, but it's just not guaranteed. So you can't say it's option B if we don't know what option B is going to be. And we can't assume the market is going to keep rising. And there's been property crashes all over the world. And one of the markets like for, for example, Japan, it never quite recovered. And let's assume there's another property crash in the UK, which I don't think there will be obviously uh, but it you can't assume prices will keep rising so it's just a caveat it's very hard to to to, to really define what your potential capital appreciation will be but if i had to guess single let family home of all the different products will be the number one product that will appreciate because that's the one in most of the demand with less supply and in particular the mid-market house say based on the average UK house price, that would be the area where I, I would guess we would see the most cap appreciation in the future. Yes, I, I'm very much inclined to agree with you there. And also I think the good thing about single family buy to let is that it's relatively low risk. Uh, and in these kind of turbulent times that we're probably gonna be facing in 2022, certainly if you're starting out, you should start out uh, and learn and cut your teeth on something that's, that's relatively low risk, relatively straightforward and simple. And the thing about cash flow, Henry, is that if you have it, even if it, it's not great, it still uh, assists you in staying in the game long enough to, to benefit from any capital growth. So this is why I, I, you know, 
when you're searching tenant demand, your your cash, your net cash flow mm. month on month is an absolutely vital metric to understand. Yes, but when you're searching tenant demand, if you're in this business the, on the longer term, the only way you can actually make it as a full time professional is by creating equity in every deal. So every deal you need to create equity. And I would advise people the simplest way to create equity is to go after derelict or properties in really poor condition where you can reconfigure and make the, that property into a highly desirable property. And then I can guarantee you, you'll never have issue with tenant demand, even in areas where demand isn't as strong as other areas, because your property is new, modern, modernized, has all the usual mod cons, maybe even having en suites, it probably will rent all day long, even in areas that maybe demand is not as strong. Mm. I think it's also worth uh, mentioning that tenant demand has definitely changed um, because of COVID-19. And again, landlords that have found that something's worked for them in the past uh, may find that it's not working for them now. So I think as we go forward into 2022, it's vital that all landlords become really good researchers uh, of tenant demand. And we've got a number of threads on Property Tribes of the different methods that you can use uh, to do this and I will put these underneath the video. Um, I think also Henry tenants priorities have changed through Covid um, and you know two of the key things that are coming through are tenants want a, a garden and some access to open space definitely balcony if you are considering buying a flat and also uh, you know home office really good broadband is very important. So again, these are all things that you need to kind of factor in into your pre-acquisition due diligence. I, I'm not so sure, Vanessa, right, that tenant demand is changing as much as much of the media is telling us. My personal feeling is that tenant demand has changed slightly, but I think in a year's, maybe two years time, 80 to 90 percent of people will be back in the office that's just my own personal view mm -hmm. i could be completely wrong about about that um so i think it's too early to say for sure if tenant demand is changing in the short term it looks like it has adjusted slightly but let's see how this plays out over the rest of 2022 because it's only very early in 2022 now Yes, of course. And, you know, we've seen some of the so-called mini trends that developed over the past 18 months. We, we've definitely seen them start to reverse in the latter part of, of 2021. So as we're always saying, property is a long term business and it's not very advisable to make decisions based on short term issues. Um, one really easy way to determine uh, tenant demand, Henry, is, is to buy a tenanted property. Uh, you've got income from day one of ownership, you've got uh, ability to look at the tenant's payment history, you can see how the tenant is keeping the property. Um, our friends and partners at Vesta have a platform where you can buy and sell tenanted properties, HMOs, portfolios and indeed blocks of flats. So what, what's your view on buying a tenanted property? Have you ever, ever bought one? Um, I've only bought properties where there's issues or problems, mm. where the tenants have certain legal rights to stay on. For example, I bought properties with protected tenancies, which was a really high risk strategy, but I obviously bought the property extremely cheap. In, in my case, I had a good relationship with the protected tenant after I bought the property or before I bought the property, sorry. And I simply asked them, would they consider moving out for it? for a fee, effectively, I was offering them some compensation. Um, tenanted properties, if you want to create value, you're effectively paying retail price and you're buying a property which may or may, if, let's assume it's in good condition. If it's in good condition, then you're paying full market price. And, and at the moment that would be at the peak of the highest peaks of all history of the market in the whole of the, the, the forever basically. So me personally, as a developer and a trader, um, I like to buy properties in really poor condition. But for somebody who wants a hands-off investment, then yes. But the caveat here would be that they would have to check the actual bank statement payments for that tenancy, because I wouldn't tend to believe the agents if they had said to me they've paid the rent or the rents up to date. 
I would need to have a full conversation with the tenants, meet the tenants, and then check the bank statements if it was me, because I personally would be wary simply because I don't know who these tenants are and what they're like. And at least before exchange of contracts, I would want to do that level of research. Yes, and also you you touched on it in, in your answer that there are some types of tenancies where the tenant has much uh, greater tenure than just a standard yeah. AST. Um, so for newbies buying a tenanted property, you do need to understand that tenure. Uh, I guess as we close this out now, Henry, um, let's look to the future. Uh, tenant demand in 2022, I think all the indicators are that it's going to remain very strong. Uh, towards the tail end of last year, we've heard about affordability problems for first time buyers. Um, there's you know, threats of interest rate rises where people may lose confidence in the property market and decide to rent rather than buy to see how it pans out. So actually there are a lot of uh, very positive indicators for um, you know, good, and even increased tenant demand over, over 2022. Is that something um, that you can see happening? Yes, I, I think t tenant demand will be at its highest level ever in 2022. Um, one of the main reasons for that is because a lot of new development sites are now not being built because of the increase in material costs. Mm. So there's a bit of delay in that. Secondly, the planning system is a little bit clogged up and slow as well at the moment because of COVID. But surprisingly, next year, if there ever was a chance of a correction in property, it could come next year. But what's the first thing that happens if there is a property correction? Less people buy and sell property and less new rental properties be become available on the market. Mm -hmm. So there's less supply again. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not an internal, you know, a, an optimist about everything in property, just because I'm in property, I'm a very cautious person. But I would say the one thing that I would be very com confident about is tenant demand going forward in the future in 2022. Well, that's really, really good to hear your views, uh, Henry. And it's lovely because we've actually come full circle right back to the beginning where we said find the, the demand before you create the supply and I do hope that between us we've given our viewers some indication of how important it is to do that and also some of the methods that you can use uh, to actually find out where there is tenant demand, uh, the type of tenant demographic in that area and also the type of property that those tenants are seeking. So um, thank you very much for joining me on this call Henry. It's it's wonderful to have uh, somebody's input who's been in property since uh, 1990. Uh, so great to great to have your input and everybody watching. Thank you for watching and please join me to the, tomorrow uh, where we will continue with our video mini mini series where we are talking about digitization of the landlord life cycle. Mm -hmm.